I propose to do is to introduce our five wonderful panelists to the April 1st class of the Business and Law Colloquium. So because Catherine Van Tassel, my colleague, will do the general introduction to regulation of businesses, I will start with her biography first, and then I will move to the other four panelists. So Catherine Van Tassel is a visiting professor of law at Case Western. She is with the Law Medicine Center. Previously, she served as Dean of the University of San Francisco Law School for seven years. It is the oldest law school in San Francisco. She has also served as an expert consultant on FDA issues for Georgetown University. She also assisted them in an in-class and online Master of Sciences in Regulatory Affairs. And she was founder of two health law programs, one at Akron and one at Creighton. Her book, co-authored with another professor on Food and Drug Administration, has been cited by the US Supreme Court, by numerous federal district courts and courts of appeals. And her research has been cited by judges on the Supreme Courts of New Mexico and Nevada on cases of first impression. I learned some things about my colleague today, so that's rather wonderful. Yelena Katz, a former wonderful student of mine, is with the Benish Law Firm. She is a labor and employment attorney at Benish. Yelena works with employers on a variety of federal and state labor and employment matters, including issues arising under the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII, as well as <clears throat> other federal and state employment related laws. She has experience representing clients in collective and class action wage and hour cases, as well as in National Labor Relations Act litigation and counseling, including union organizing campaigns, collective bargaining matters, and contract arbitrations. She represents uh, employers before administrative agencies, federal courts, and state courts, and of course, many other things, but I'm giving you only the, the foundations of her practice. Eric Lang is uh, with the Squire Patton Boggs Law Firm. He is an associate in the firm's environmental safety and health practice group. Eric's practice focuses on environmental litigation and compliance and risk management counseling. He has assisted clients in matters involving federal and state agencies related to a variety of environmental laws, including the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA, Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, and various state laws and regulations. She, Eric previously worked as an engineer where he performed technical environmental work for municipalities, giving him a great foundation for his environmental law practice at Squire Patton Boggs. Mary Maloney is at Jones Day. She has significant experience in designing, implementing, and administering qualified and non-qualified retirement and deferred compensation plans and other benefit programs. She has counseled a wide variety of employers, including professional service partnerships and tax exempt organizations, and has extensive experience in the benefit and compensation aspects of mergers, acquisitions, dispositions, and corporate bankruptcies. She has in-depth knowledge on technical compliance issues, including non-discrimination issues, and regulatory interpretations. She has considerable experience in dealing with the Internal Revenue Series Service, the Department of Labor, and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Judy Steiner, our panelist, also another former wonderful student of mine, is the Executive Vice President and Chief Risk Officer at Banner Bank. In this role, Ms. Steiner is responsible for overseeing the company's risk and compliance functions as well as the bank's interactions with industry regulators. She is also a member of the bank's executive management committee. Prior to joining Banner Bank, Ms. Steiner spent 25 years with First Merit in executive leadership positions, including executive vice president and chief risk officer, secretary and general counsel. During her time at First Merit, the bank grew to $25 billion in assets, and she expertly led the compliance team through those growth phases. During that same tenure, she gained significant experience in mergers and acquisitions, including whole bank purchases, FDIC transactions, and bank purchases from peer divestitures. So with that, I'm going to turn over our very accomplished panel to Catherine Van, Van Tassel, my colleague, and she will probably share her screen with some slides in a bit. Thank you everybody for being part of our class today. So, uh, what I'm seeing, uh, Juliet, is that I can't share my screen because I've been disabled 
the, so your participants can't share their screens. Um, if you switch me over to host, um, you go to the participant list yeah. and, and you uh, hover over my name. Okay. Um, and you should hover over not my laptop, but my regular. Uh. Um, my regular name, I think. Uh, I host on one of your computers. Yes, host. Okay, there, there we go. Let's see if I can share my screen now. Did it work? Yes, it did. Awesome. Thank you for the explanation. Okay, can you hear me okay now, Juliet? I can hear you perfectly. Can, can the you class hear me? Okay, wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. Before I start, I'd like to thank Juliet for inviting me to speak with you here today. Before my wonderful co palants take the mic, I'd like to give you a bit of background on a new field of study called by many GRC, or Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance. What is GRC? GRC is a new field of study that was created in response to the growth of the regulatory state over the past several decades. In order to deal with the explosion of regulations, organizations develop departments and programs such as performance management, risk management, compliance, corporate social responsibility, and so on. Unfortunately, these department, departments and programs were often siloed, resulting in troubling drawbacks, including high costs, lack of visibility into risks, inability to address third party risks, difficulty measuring risk adjusted performance, and too many negative surprises. What businesses learned is that when these activities are siloed, it's highly likely that counterproductive objectives are established, suboptimum strategies are selected, and performance isn't optimized. A new field of study called GRC, referring to governance, risk, and compliance, was born to deal with these unintended consequences. GRC has its own methods of critical thinking, risk assessment, and managerial sociology that allows lawyers and business executives to protect their stakeholders by anticipating and reducing enterprise risks. GRC is a shorthand reference to the critical capabilities that must work together to achieve principled performance, the capabilities that integrate the governance, management, and assurance of performance, risk, and compliance activities. This includes the work done by departments like internal audit, compliance, risk, legal, finance, IT, HR, as well as the lines of business executive suites and the board itself. GRC are three disciplines that can help ensure an organization meets its objectives. According to a literature review and survey of governance, risk management, and compliance GRC professionals, GRC is an integrated holistic approach to organization-wide GRC ensuring, ensuring that an organization acts ethically, correct, and in accordance with its risk appetite, internal policies and external regulations through the alignment of strategy, processes, technology, and people, thereby improving efficiency and effectiveness. GRC allows a company to go from this to this. GRC is a discipline that aims to synchronize information and activity across governance and compliance in order to operate more efficiently enable effective information sharing, more effectively report activities, and avoid wasteful overlaps. Although interpreted differently in various organizations, GRC typically encompasses activities such as corporate governance, enterprise risk management, corporate compliance with applicable laws and regulations. GRC is a three-legged stool. The first of the three legs is governance. Governance describes the overall management approach through which senior executives direct and control the entire organization using a combination of management information and hierarchical management control structures. Governance activities ensure that critical management information reaching the executive team is sufficiently complete, accurate, and timely to enable appropriate management decision making and provide the control mechanisms to ensure that strategies, directions, and instructions from management are carried out systematically and effectively. The second leg of the stool is risk management. Risk management is the set of processes through which management identifies, analyzes, and where necessary responds appropriately to risks that might adversely affect realization of the organization's business objectives. The response to risk typically depends on their perceived gravity and involves controlling, avoiding, accepting, or transferring them to a third party, whereas organizations routinely manage a wide range of risks, for example, technological risks, commercial financial risk, information security risk, etc. Compliance is the third leg of the stool. 
Compliance means conforming with stated requirements. At an organizational level, it's achieved through management processes which identify the applicable requirements defined, for example, in laws, regulations, contracts, strategies, and policies, assess the state of compliance, assess the risks and potential costs of non-compliance against the projective expenses to achieve compliance, and hence prioritize, fund, and initiate any corrective actions deemed necessary. My area of specialty is healthcare. So what is GRC in the context of healthcare? The universe of regulatory compliance and enterprise risk for healthcare organizations, providers, and healthcare product manufacturers reaches well beyond traditional corporate compliance to include activities such as cl clinical care, quality, billing, and health information management. The enterprise-wide compliance risk universe is as broad in scope as the range of all healthcare operations. For example, in addition to the inherent challenges of patient care and trends, such as reduced reimbursement and increasing costs, providers and organizations are subject to ever-increasing and often complex rules governing the coverage and reimbursement of healthcare services. Since federal and state-sponsored healthcare programs pay for approximately one-third of the nation's total healthcare spending, the protections afforded the government by fraud and abuse laws are growing increasingly robust. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, mandates that all healthcare providers establish and maintain effective compliance programs that are similar to those described in the federal sentencing guidelines as a condition of enrollment in Medicare, Medicaid, and in the federal and state-funded Children's Health Insurance Program, also known as CHIP. These obligations apply to multiple segments of the healthcare industry, such as hospitals, nursing homes, third-party billers, durable medical equipment suppliers, and drug and device manufacturers, and are designed to encourage the development and use of internal controls to monitor adherence to statutes, regulations, and program requirements. In recent years, the risk of noncompliance in this area have grown dramatically to the extent that corporate compliance has become one of the most significant risk areas that healthcare enterprises face. And far from solely supporting adherence to reimbursement regulation, compliance, and enterprise risk management in the era of healthcare reform also encodes, uh, encompasses quality and risk as critical components of a combined process. Many financial relationships under healthcare reform, for example, pay for performance, outcomes, management arrangements, address quality of care issues, and Medicare conditions of participation extend beyond payment requirements to include quality concerns. Today's compliance investigations and enforcement actions are increasingly focused on the quality of care provided to beneficiaries of government-funded healthcare programs, and compliance with applicable laws and regulations is also important from an accreditation standpoint. For example, the Joint Commission explicitly requires that hospitals comply with laws and regulations, and their rational, rationale reinforces the connections among leadership, culture, and compliance. According to the Joint Commission, leaders' decisions and work affect, affect, either directly or indirectly, every aspect of operations. They are the driving force behind the culture of the hospital. Leaders establish the ethical framework in which the hospital operates, creates pro policies and procedures, and secures resources and services that support patient safety and quality care, treatment, and services. These are just a few examples of myriad complex regulatory schemes that govern healthcare products and services and the delivery and financing of healthcare. In response, these healthcare organizations are forming and growing large corporate compliance and risk management departments to ensure that obligations under these laws and regulations are being met by the organization, all while generating value through compliance and ethics. Of note, there is a large growth in jobs in the area of GRC. Um, there, you're gonna be hearing from our panelists about uh, several other areas uh, of um, specific areas of um, GRC. Uh, in order to pre better prepare our students here at Case Western to work in regulatory compliance and risk management careers, we'll be standing up a new class in the spring of 2021 entitled Governance, Risk Management and Compliance. According to the definition or the, the description of the class, the course involves the detection and handling of potential compliance lapses, including the conduct of investigations in the role of whistleblowers and attorney advisors. Students will explore the broader compliance functions of social responsibility, sustainability, and human rights. Um, and I just went over, sorry about that. I'm gonna reread this very, very beginning of this if I can. Hold on one second, I've gotta move something off my screen. 
Um, the course actually deals with the institutional dynamics that allow compliance officers to interact with business owners and regulators in order to properly risk manage compliance requirements while creating and enforcing a code of conduct that champions an ethical corporate co culture. The students are also introduced to a code of ethics and corporate governance, including the board, role of the board of directors and executives in managing firms and overseeing risk management and regulatory compliance. Then the course is also going to be covering the detection and handling of uh, potential compliance lapses, including the conduct of investigations and the role of whistleblowers and attorney advisors. Students will also explore the broader compliance functions of social responsibility, sustainability, and human rights. As with the regulatory course uh, that we're also going to be offering, this course is going to be useful for a foundation for any student stu studying any highly regulated field, we're going to hear about several today, where risk management is required, such as in healthcare or finance settings. And so I thank you very much for listening to this introduction of what GRC is. And now we're going to hear from the uh, folks um, with some specialties that are um, uh, going to be very, very highly interesting. So I turn the mic over to Juliet. And I would like to, in turn, <clears throat> turn the class over to Elena Katz. And at this point, I have a PowerPoint if Elena wants me to share it, and it would be uh, right here. Um, so would that be the time to share it? Um, let's see, now I have to do this properly. Share screen, oh. Whoops, somehow. Um, so somehow I'm trying to share the screen, but I can't. I can get started without the PowerPoint if you want, while you work on it. Um, okay. Juliet, do you want me to share a screen? Sure. Share the labor and employment screen. Let's see if I can find the labor and unemployment. I've got financial. I've got, uh, Eric's. You can also switch the yes, host to Professor Kostritsky and that should let her share the screen again. I think that's what happened I, is I made you a host. Oh yes, that's probably it. Do you want I to switch over or do you I, want me to share? If you, um, if you make me a host, I can then share it because I have it. Okay, you're now a host. Great, I think it'll work now. <clears throat> Sorry for that. Um, so here we are. And um, I can share the screen and I will pick. Uh, let's see, where is it? For some reason, it's not showing up. I, I actually have it. So if you want me to, if you want to give me back as host, then I can pop it right up there. Okay. Great, thanks, Catherine. Whoops. I'm getting there. Okay. I no problem. I've just We're got not... the icons right in the way here. And here it is. And from the beginning, and there they are. Are we are we good now? Yes. Everyone can hear me? Good. Thanks, Elena. Pats, um, we're so happy you're here. Well, so I have the slides, but I guess I'll start out with just talking about my practice in general. And so I've been practicing about six years. Most of that time has been in labor and employment. I started at Jones Day. I was there for about five years and now about a year at Benish. So at Jones Day, I had a chance to work in different practice areas during my first year and before I joined the labor practice group. And the reason I really picked the labor group was because it's a practice area that deals with a lot. It deals with litigation, it deals with corporate work, there's a lot of counseling to it. So it was an area that I felt like I would never be bored in. So I joined the practice group in the summer of my first year practicing. So there's basically four parts to the labor group, uh, and I can only speak from the defense side because that's the only practice I've done. Uh, so my particular practice, there's four parts to it. 
First is employment litigation, which is litigation based on, go to the next slide. Uh, it's based on some of these regulations that you see here, like Title VII, the American Disabilities Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, FMLA. So we would go to court and we would defend the employer against employees and against class actions brought by employees uh, with some of these regulations. And that's, I would say, the biggest part of the practice. Some of these we don't uh, litigate as often. I haven't done a lot of ERISA litigation, for example. The Warren Act is one of those things that's not litigated often, although it might be coming back um, because of what's happening right now with COVID-19 and businesses having to shut down without giving notice of the shutdowns. We might see a lot of litigation coming out of the Warren Act in the future about that. But basically we litigate uh, in disputes that come up with employees and with classes of employees who claim that they, their rights have been violated under most of these laws here. Uh, the other big part of the practice is labor. So what we do is we work, we work on the side of the employer and we'll do collective bargaining with unions. And then we would draft the collective bargaining agreement with the union. We would defend the employer in grievances and in arbitration that's brought by the union. If, they've, if the union claims that we've you know, disciplined someone too harsh there, the employer has, or that we've breached the collective bargaining agreement in any way, so we would do arbitrations, which is basically like mini trials uh, with, against the union with an arbitrator. And that's a big part of the practice. I'd say about maybe 25% of my work is union related. We'd also defend uh, the employer if a union is trying to come in. Uh, and that's the next slide, if we could go. Those are some of the, oh no, it's the next slide after that. But, um, so these are the laws that we would deal with when it comes to labor law. Those are the three main acts that uh, regulate labor in this country. And so we would obviously be familiar with all three of these and defend the employer against unions or against employees in order to collective bargaining. That's a big part of the practice. The other big part of the practice is counseling work. Uh, with labor and employment, you're basically, in a lot of times, you're basically serving as an in-house counsel. We're often the first call of the business people, supervisors, or um, HR people about things that are coming up, especially in this last month. I, I spend about half my day on the phone now dealing with employers doing layoffs and furloughs and having to send notices and just talking people through the new laws that are being passed, the different leave laws, the sick leave laws, the FMLA expansion that's been happening with Congress last week. So we counsel employers, we talk through issues that are coming up. Uh, and before, you know, even before the COVID-19 stuff, it would be questions about, you know, my employee has been out on FMLA leave for 12 weeks. They're still not ready to come back. What do I need to do? Can I just fire them? I need to replace them. I need someone in that role. So, you know, early on, even from my first year, you would get those kind of calls and you would handle them on the spot or you would do some research, get back to the client. So it's a lot of really um, in person, you're just being part of the business and you're counseling them throughout, even if there's no litigation involved. And I really enjoy that because I think with general litigation practices, you would have a lawsuit over you know some breach of a contract but then you might never hear from that client again until they're sued again with some other contract whereas we have continued in relationships with our clients and we counsel them constantly so you know in some months like this past month it's been you know 80 percent of my practice because litigation has slowed down so much and the majority of what we're doing right now is really just working with employers to try to get them through this challenging time right now so that's the the third part Another part of the practice, and this isn't true for I think all labor and employment lawyers, but it's been the case in my career with Jones Day and Benish, is that we advise on mergers and acquisitions. So I think there was a question from a student about how employment lawyers work into deals. But what happens is that almost any time there's a, a buying or selling of a company is there's employees involved. So we look at you know, how do we transfer those employees? Do we have to draft new employment agreements for the executives that are coming over? You know, and um, we look at liabilities that could be happening. For example, is there a lawsuit out there, a class action that if we buy this company, we're gonna be, you know, our client is gonna be, get this bill if they lose this lawsuit. So we look at the litigation, we look at complaints that are filed, 
we get into the data room of a deal and try to figure out what are the different liabilities, how do we bring these people over, do we need to take all the people, if there's unions involved, that gets complicated as well. Do we have to assume this collective bargaining agreement? Do we have to bargain for a new agreement? Things like that. So that's about 10 to 15% of the practice. It depends on the month. You know, At the end of the year, for example, there's a lot of deals closing, so that becomes a bigger part of the practice. Other times, it's not so much of a part of my practice. But those are basically the four things we deal with in the labor and employment group. And then, Within that, we, you have to be you know, an expert in a lot of these regulations that I listed on that first slide. And then you also deal with regulatory agencies pretty often. So if, for example, if you wanna bring a disability lawsuit in this country, you need to first go to the EEOC and file, or a state version of the EEOC, and you file a charge of discrimination. So we would defend the employer in front of that agency. We'd either do a mediation or a position statement and then depending on what that EEOC or the, the state version of it, that agency decides, then that gives the employee the right to go and file the lawsuit. So right now, for example, next week, I have a mediation with the Maine Human Rights, uh, up in Maine, Human Rights Commission about uh, a charge that's been filed against our employer or a client of ours. And so we do the mediation. If that doesn't work, we would do a position statement and then if they find that there's been no discrimination, then they would issue a notice of the right to sue to that employee, and then they can go and file a lawsuit. That's what's happening. I have a case right now in Texas where the, we had defended it in the Texas EEOC, and we won, I guess. They found no discrimination, but the next day, or the next month, I should say, the employee filed the lawsuit anyways. So now we're defending the lawsuit. So those are kind of, um, the biggest parts of what we work with, and we work with agencies at the state level, and uh, of course, the EOC is a federal agency, the National Labor Relations Board, federal agency. So it's, uh, let's go back to the previous slide. And then also the state versions of them, there's all these state laws that we deal with, which is the workers' comp. I don't do a lot of workers' comp work, but that's a part of the practice for some people in my group. Um, unemployment also I haven't done too much with, but again, some people will defend employers in unemployment hearings. And then we also have to know some laws at the local level. You know, there's the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga Human Rights Ordinance, which is basically the same as the federal law, but it applies to one or more, an employer of one or more employees. So there's some litigation with that. Even Cleveland has its own laws. So my practice is more national. I don't do a lot of it at the Cuyahoga or Cleveland level, but you have to be familiar then with the state and local laws in other states, um, in, depending on where our clients are. And then you go forward a couple slides to the last slide. Um, so we also have to look at new laws that are coming out. So as I mentioned this past month, we've had to deal with a lot of new litigation from Congress Every day we're reading the DOL regulations, the Department of Labor, and how they're in, uh, interpreting these laws that are coming out. And every day right now we're dealing with hours of phone call from our clients and how to walk them through the sick leave that they have to offer, the loans that they can apply for under the new CARES Act that just passed last week, and the changes to unemployment. We have a lot of clients right now who are deciding whether it's better to lay off people and let them claim unemployment versus trying to continue paying payroll. And so we look through that calculus and work with employers on how to do that. We have employers who are right now trying to just cut pay and seeing what they can do there. So I'm redrafting employment agreements for executives who agreed to voluntarily take a 25% pay cut during this crisis right now. So we're looking at employment agreements, redrafting those and seeing what we can do there. So it's just, it's a practice where you really, you need to, you, you're a subject matter expert in some sense. You have all these laws that you deal with. There's also new stuff that's coming up pretty often. And this, this past month is certainly a case of that. So that's basically an overview of my practice. I don't know if I should take questions now or is that till the end? Well, let's, let's pause just for a moment maybe. And yeah. if, if there are any questions that, are, that any student would really like to ask Elena right now. That, 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 came, that came about maybe as a result of her remarks here. 
12. Uh, if not, we can save questions to the end. Um, so, Eric, I think that I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to attempt to share the screen. Oh, I can't do that. Um, so, Catherine, if you want to share Eric's uh, slideshow presentation, I think you have it. I do. I do. So let me, let me take care of that right now. That'd be wonderful. There we go. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Can everyone hear me all right? Perfectly. Yeah, great. So um, I was actually a classmate with Yelena. Um, I believe we took Professor Kostritsky's property class together. So um, That was a while ago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed. So um, my, uh, my background pre-law school was I had done technical work under the Clean Water Act. So when I was considering what area to move into after law school, environmental law was a pretty natural uh, segue for me. Um, and uh, so I've been with Squire about five years now. I was one year with the firm before that. Um, and Squire's practice has been pretty good to me because it really um, keeps me interested by allowing me to do a wide range of uh, environmental uh, law work from uh, litigation and mergers and acquisitions to a lot of compliance work. Um, and I really think uh, one builds off the other. So it's a pretty great way to set up an environmental practice. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll jump into it. So maybe the next slide. Thanks. So similar to what Yelena was talking about, in the, in the United States, you really have to pay a lot of attention to where you're at because there are federal laws, state laws, and local laws that all regulate, um, and well, I should say and regulations under all those laws too, that are related to um, environmental requirements that are placed on businesses. Um, there's the, the environmental law area is somewhat unique in that there's these um, pretty detailed federal laws and federal regulations mm -hmm. under those laws that are then primarily carried out by the states. Not always, but um, that's how they were set up. So while you can expect certain consistent mm -hmm. requirements between states, there's also differences. Um, and that goes all the way down to the local level as well. So just as an example, for much of the state of Ohio, um, if you're looking at air permitting and um, what agency is going to be enforcing against you, if, uh, if you violate those requirements, you're probably going to be dealing with the Ohio EPA. Um, the federal EPA could step in also, but if you're in Cuyahoga County or parts of the surrounding counties, it's actually the county itself that does the air permitting and some of that work. So. Um, environmental law is pretty complex as who's doing what, and you have to keep that in mind. Um, in, in the state of Tennessee, you can be on one side of a river and have one set of rules, and then on the other side of the river, you're in a different county and have a different set of rules. So that's just a few examples about how it, it really gets quite interesting quite quickly. Um, but like I said, it's all based on, it, it all flows through some basic federal laws and I'll go through some of those a little bit here. Um, I thought also to start off, I'd give you a little bit of idea about, of, about how um, different businesses might uh, have to start worrying about environmental requirements. And uh, one of those is enforcement. So I mentioned Ohio EPA or US EPA or different uh, departments of environmental quality or whatever it may be in every, any given state will send people out to inspect facilities um, for environmental specific requirements and also bring enforcement actions when you're not complying. Um, environmental law has a lot of citizen suit provisions. So you could end up actually 
um, in litigation as a business with citizens or citizen groups claiming that you're not in compliance. Um, there's also rulemaking, which sets the rules, which in environmental laws is quite important. You have a lot of rules coming out of um, both the, the federal US EPA and on the state level that businesses need to be aware of and need to be tracking because those um, from one administration to another can really change how the rules are interpreted. So we help clients um, quite often follow those rules and um, see what rules are coming out that could be problematic and how can you kind of fight back and try and make it so that um, you can still operate under um, rules that are coming out. And um, the, the last thing I'll mention is just general compliance. So um, businesses that do environmental self audits, um, there's, there's some benefits to that and just kind of knowing where you're at um, before an inspector comes out. Some, some states give notice of that, some don't, but you might wanna take a look and make sure you, you have everything up to snuff. And then a lot of what I do, as I mentioned, is the M&A work. So if you're buying a business, you really wanna dig in and make sure you, you understand how that business has complied with environmental laws and what risks there are. Um, so with that said, I'll move on to the, these bottom bullets here. Um, so what kind of environmental regulations can you expect to, um, to uh, see as a business? The answer is they're very wide ranging, um, very complex. Um, I have a number of partners at my firm that I've worked with who have been in the business since environmental law started. And I can tell you, they, they don't have it down. So there's, there's very few people who have everything down and um, keeps us busy, which is good. But uh, I tried to break it down into some general areas that uh, we kind of think about. And the first one I'm gonna talk more about on the next few slides. But anytime your business is generating any type of a waste stream, whether it's a solid waste, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, air emissions, water discharges, there's a pretty well-established um, regulatory regime for those type of discharges and what you have to do. Um, another area is anytime you're selling or even handling certain materials, there's regulations that come along with those. So um, the, the federal TSCA is um, a federal act that is kind of taking a look at certain chemicals um, if you go into Europe or if you go into certain states like California and you sell in those markets, there's even more stringent requirements. And uh, there's, there's some very targeted federal rules. There, there are laws and rules um, such as those that target pesticides. So, so what you sell and what you handle is important. Um, oh, and I should mention on the handling side, even if you are selling something that's non-hazardous, non-regulated, part of the process of making that product requires some type of material that's deemed to be hazardous. There's oftentimes reporting requirements in states just to, just to let the public know that you're handling that at your facility. Um, and also to keep people ready because spills do happen. And so what's on site? Um, moving on to the third bullet point there, there's aspects of your operations themselves that are regulated, um, primarily from a safety standpoint, industrial hygiene. So you wanna make sure that, you're, that you know what requirements there are under OSHA, um, for example, that uh, op that's regulate your operations. Um, as far as historic effects on the environment, so even something that uh, your business did 50 years ago, or maybe even a predecessor to your business did 50 years ago, those type of things can still come back and place uh, current requirements on you. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, I wanted to mention just ownership of property. There are certain things that, um, that come up under environmental laws um, just by the fact of owning property that you need to be aware of. And I'll mention some of those also. So moving to the next slide, I want to spend a little bit of time here on some of the different waste streams. So hazardous and solid waste, um, those are generally regulated under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act or RICRA. Um, and uh, those regulations apply 
to two different classifications of people. Well, um, those that generate hazardous waste and those requirements are, are really wide ranging. They can vary by state, but generally uh, it gets into um, how long hazardous waste can stay on your site, when it goes from being a, uh, a material you're using or recycling to a waste and how you have to handle it. So an example of that is maybe your employees are using gloves to handle what's hazardous waste. Those gloves actually become hazardous waste. So you can't just throw them in a garbage can or mix them with other things. There are certain uh, storage requirements, putting, uh, putting a lid on them, how long they can stay there. And that's all under RECRA. And the, the second category I have is those that kind of treat or transport, dispose of or handle hazardous waste from others. And all of those businesses need to be permitted. And those permits are difficult to get. Um, so states primarily in, implement RECRA and many of them supplement it. So you really have to be aware. This is an area where I especially point out to be aware of where you are and what rules apply. Then my final note here is uh, CERCLA or Superfund. Um, as I was talking about before, uh, it can reach back to where your hazardous waste, um, or in some cases even non-hazardous, where they ended up and what they're causing on the environment, whether it be your property or somebody else's property. So that's, this is actually one of the largest cost liability areas. There's a billion dollar Superfund sites across the country where the, usually the federal government, sometimes the state governments, can go after just one entity. So if you have um, a, a, a foot in, in, a, in an, a somebody else's site, you can literally be brought in and uh, held accountable for the whole site in the eyes of the agency. So, so that's, that's really the impetus. Well, that is a impetus for making sure where your wastes end up, they, they are handled correctly. So. That's on the solid waste side, jump into the next slide, um, is air emissions. And so there's a federal act called the Clean Air Act, and it regulates um, emissions into the ambient air of a number of different uh, uh, parameters. I listed some there, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, sulfur, di sulfur dioxide. So what you're thinking about here is um, um, a, a, a steel plant, a power plant that's emitting a lot of particulate matter or sulfur dioxide. But you also have to think about some um, lesser emitters. If you have a painting room or a coat room at one, coating room at one of your businesses or even just a mixing tank, there's air emissions coming off of that. Um, so what, just a couple of notes here under the Clean Air Act, um, it requires a permit and Title V permits are for major emitters. I mentioned a PTIO also, that, that's the Ohio equivalent of a minor source. And um, another requirement is that you operate control equipment. So if you're that uh, power plant, you have to make sure that you have um, certain different uh, control equipment pieces that take sulfur dioxide out of the air or, to take particulate matter out of the air before you emit it, you emit it. And then also there's reporting requirements and there actually could be limits on what you can send to the air. So the Clean Air Act is um, a pretty active area of regulation that anyone who's putting anything into the ambient air has to think about. Um, jump into the next slide. Um, is water discharges. And like I said, this is what I kind of came through the ranks on. So this is um, one of my favorite things to talk about. But, but um, anytime you discharge uh, pollutants to surface water, uh, you need a permit for that under the Clean Water Act. Um, so businesses who discharge directly to a surface water, um, they might have an industrial wastewater permit that's individualized for them, and that's going to have treatment requirements and, um, and requirements on what can go into the waters. Um, there's also stormwater permits, non-contact cooling water permits, and these, so 
when EPA was trying to figure out how to do these, they knew it would be too much work to require anyone who sent storm, storm water to a stream to get an individual permit. So they came up with these general permits that have less, restric less restrictive requirements. Um, and then a final note, many businesses send their water discharges to sewer systems. You still need a permit for that. You still need to make sure you're complying with regulations. Um, so jumping to the next slide, I just thought I'd finish by going through just a different, a few different types of businesses and how they might, how these ty different types of uh, regulations might apply to them. So jumping to the next slide, just by owning land, um, a business has certain requirements. Um, so we were dealing with a property owner recently who had a nice little pond on their land didn't even think about the fact that that pond was held back by a dam and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources comes in and tells them they need to do these multi-million dollar um, um, upgrades to their dam. So, um, and that can happen. I've seen oil and gas wells, there was requirement for wetland. So it, there, there are certain features on your land that's uh, particularly on the state side, um, there are certain regulations. Now, just by owning a building where people work. There's different OSHA requirements, different things under the Clean Air Act. The, the um, example I've, I have here is asbestos. So even if it's not your employees in there, you still have to think about what your, um, some of your environmental requirements. And then the last uh, bullet point here is just, just by owning the land, there may be certain things that you need to do. Um, I have a picture down there at the bottom. There's uh, if there's contaminants in the ground, you have to worry about worker safety or public safety if they're going into your buildings um, from materials from those pollutants um, becoming vaporized and entering buildings. And also there's some states where you just, every time you sell property, if you're in a certain category, you have to do a determination to see if you need to do certain sampling or determine what's on your land. So there's a lot just by owning land and then jumping to the next slide. The one that people think about the most is probably manufacturing businesses because the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and RICRA all are likely to apply to those uh, businesses. Um, and also what I was talking about earlier with selling products into certain marketplaces. So these manufacturing businesses are really the heavy ones that are um, subject to environmental regulation. And then jumping to my last slide here, um, the businesses that I think we see the most that are surprised by things are non-manufacturing businesses, but there are a lot of examples where, um, where non-manufacturing businesses do have to think about their environmental obligations. Um, the first bullet point I have here, say you're, say you're Home Depot and you're selling products, you don't really think about environmental regulations, but say you have a bunch of paint that just expired and you throw that out, you may have just violated RECRA. So you have to really be on top of things like that. Um, and if you have a building that has a boiler, that may have air um, considerations. Um, gas stations or other businesses that have um, underground storage tanks, or if you have any equipment that has used oil, you're gonna fall under certain RECRA requirements. Um, and the next one that I have here, any business who, even if you just have an office building, um, the lighting ballast in your office building, those are regulated. Um, we had a client who really didn't think about environmental obligations at all, and then they're getting notices that they might be liable under CERCLA for not uh, disposing of their lighting ballast, ballast um, in the right way. And then my last, bullet point there is hospitals um, have medical waste. And so that's all um, regulated. Um, and then just the last bullet point here, I wanted to, you to think about, um, it's a lot of businesses really don't like um, to spend a lot of money or time thinking about or complying with environmental regulations. They wanna do the minimum. Um, so it makes it hard sometimes if you're the one in the business um, that's bringing those to the forefront. But we do work with some businesses where environmental regulation is their business. So under RECRA, I mentioned if you're handling other people's waste, you need a TS, TSDF permit. So those are kind of, from an environmental standpoint, your favorite clients to work with, because if you can help get them a permit that makes them money, they're gonna be really uh, thankful for that. So 
that's just kind of something I wanted to keep in your mind that a lot of these regulatory requirements uh, don't make money, they lose money. But in some examples, uh, they are the money makers. So that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions now, um, or I would invite anyone to email me if you have any questions at any point. So does anyone have any Anyone have any questions for Eric before we move on to Mary Maloney? Uh, yeah, a quick question. You mentioned in the beginning of your presentation about when some businesses will do uh, self audits mm -hmm. to try and identify issues themselves. Um, have you had any type of experience with issues being where someone may not want to do a self audit in case they like how, how do you balance that tension between the risk of finding something, but also the possible um, uh, mediation if they do? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, one that's actually been addressed by US EPA. So they've put out a rule that actually incentivizes um, doing a self audit. So if you do a self audit and you find something and you act quickly enough, you won't get penalized for it. Um, so you may still have to pay to do some type of uh, compliance work, but um, if you can find something that might have been a $15,000 penalty um, and you can avoid that penalty, um, that's, that's really the incentive to doing a self audit. Um, the downside of it is you do have to report that to EPA and follow the rules of it. Um, so, so there is some balancing. As, a, as lawyers in this area, we really try to push doing some things under uh, privilege so that if, uh, so it doesn't necessarily come out, um, but that's, that's always shaky grounds too. So that's a really good question and I hope I answered it for you. Any other questions? So, then we would move on to Mary Maloney. And let's see, Catherine, since you're the host, do you have Mary's two or three page handout? Or you can make me the host and I think I have it. I know where it is on my screen, but. I'll go ahead and make you the host. Okay. And then I will <clears throat> share this. Okay, well, while you're getting that set up. Um, just want to give you a little background. So I've been doing this for a little bit longer than the other people. Let's just say over 25 years and we'll leave it at that. Um, we represent large corporate clients because let's face it, who else can afford our bills? Um, many of them are publicly traded. We also represent private um, companies and hedge funds and things like that. Um, we very represent very rarely represent employees. Sometimes we represent CEOs, but we really are on the company side, the plan sponsors, things like that. Um, like Elena, um, I like our practice. I'm in the employee benefits and executive compensation section. And I like it because it's very broad based. We do a lot of consulting work. So you see the same clients again and again, you get to know their people and their employee benefit plans. I get to work with the litigators because there's always litigation about a retirement plan or a severance agreement or something. We work very closely with the labor and employment lawyers. Also do a lot of M&A. Um, there were two questions uh, in that, that people had sent in, so I can just address those right now. Somebody was asking when you have an M&A transaction and the target employees come in, number one, do they get upset when you change their benefits? Well, of course they do. Um, uh, most of the time though, if you're dealing with a large corporations where company A is buying company B, they have a standstill agreement for at least a year saying that you're not gonna change the um, target's benefits in more than a insubstantial way. And frankly, it's gonna take at least a year in order to integrate the plans. You can't just go willy nilly and say, okay, we're gonna put everybody on our plans immediately. Um, if it's, there's also a difference between a stock deal and an asset deal. An asset deal, you can pick and choose what benefit plans you want to take or don't even take any of the plans. Same thing with the employees. You don't have to take all of the employees. With a stock deal, everything comes with you. So all their 401k plans, all of their retirement plans, all of their health plans. So then you actually have to take um, specific action in order to terminate them. So that's how that 
type of thing works. You also have to work, as, you, as Elena said, you have to work with collective bargaining agreements. Those say, you can't touch our plans unless you bargain with us. Um, so in addition uh, to the things that I'm gonna talk about now, COVID-19 has turned our world upside down. I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. So there has been litigation and notices and IRS and everything has changed and we're getting inundated with um, clients who are fighting for their lives. So they need to suspend 401k contributions, suspending matching contributions. What can we do? How can we take benefits away? Um, then there are other ones who want to do, they want to do things that are nice for people. How can we give charitable contributions? How can we put up a vacation sharing bank? Um, what else can we do? So um, each of those questions, you know, there's all kinds of regulations that are out there now um, for the people who want to be nice, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, so we have to say, hold back, you know, you can't allow people to stop their deferral contributions under a non-qualified plan because code section 409A right now says you can't do it. We're hoping the IRS is going to come up with some notice eventually that says, yes, they can do it. But these are the type of questions that we're facing right now. So no luck finding my... <laughs> we're, we're, we're just about to find it. There, there it is. Catherine has come through wonderfully. Okay. So... Um, if anybody had a chance to look at the large outline that I sent as background material, employee benefits are highly regulated area. And the type of regulation depends on whether it's a retirement plan, which a retirement plan is generally something where you get cash payments after termination of employment. So like a 401k plan or a pension plan. And a welfare benefit is everything else. A severance plan, a medical plan, dental, um, disability and things like that. Some of the regulations apply to all of those benefits and some only apply to retirement benefits or welfare benefits. So what I've done is just try and summarize a few of the laws that apply and we'll go through this chart and I'll go relatively quickly because I do want everybody to be able to um, have their time and also to ask questions. So the first law that I um, summarized is COBRA and COBRA is actually governed by the IRS and the Department of Labor, and it's a federal law that requires employers, if you have more than 20 employees, to continue offering group health insurance after somebody incurs a termination of employment or some other um, qualifying events like a divorce or a kid turning 26, lose some, where you lose your employer health insurance coverage. So what's good about that is it allows an employer to continue their medical benefits, which is vital, you know, for somebody with a medical condition. Now, the bad part is it is insanely expensive. So if you have some, a family who the employee is currently paying $400, $450 a month for family coverage, once they go on COBRA, it's at least $2,000, $2,200. So these poor people have lost their job. There is good news. You get to keep your health insurance, but you're not going to be able to afford it. So the ACA was supposed to you know, fill that gap and we'll talk about that in a, a little bit, whether it has or um, whether it's still going to be able to. The ugly part from the employer's perspective is there are technical rules that an employer has to follow. And even if you outsource the administration, which all of my clients have done, so there's Cobra Serve and Cobra Admin, and they say, you guys take care of this for us. If the administrator makes a mistake, you're still liable for the IRS penalties. So you can't just outsource it and say, we're, you know, ali ali oxen free, we don't have to worry about it. The plan sponsor is still gonna be on the hook. If you've, you know, you probably don't get ERISA litigation news, but there have been a spate of uh, class action lawsuits for large employers for technical COBRA violations. So it's, it's one law firm sending all these things out, Lowe's, Walmart, Walmart PepsiCo, and Best Buy recently settled. A lot of companies are settling because their COBRA um, notices, they were flat out wrong. Um, I have a unique perspective because I actually was, was at Jones Day, then I went in-house for 10 years, and then I came back. When I was in-house, I looked at these notices that our third party was doing, and I was like, wait a minute, these don't even comply at all. And so I made them change them for us. But a lot of people don't have in-house ERISA counsel, and so they never do that. So... That's COBRA in a nutshell. The next is the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. And what the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation does is it regulates qualified 
defined benefit plans. A qualified defined benefit plan is one that has to um, satisfy certain IRS and Department of Labor rules. It's tax advantaged from both the employer and the employee's perspective. And in order to fund the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the employer has to pay premiums um, based on the size, of the, uh, the size of the plan. If the plan is funded at a basic level, is funded at a sufficient level, then you just pay by head, by the number of participants in the plan. If it's underfunded, then you have to also pay a variable premium based on how underfunded your plan is. So, but the good thing that the PBGC does is it monitors the funded status of all the defined benefit plans in the US. It also requires plan sponsors to notify the PBGC if certain things happen. Hey, we're gonna sell some assets. The PBG says, oh no, no, you have to tell us about it because we're, we're first in line as a creditor. And so if you're selling something that's really valuable, we wanna know about it because we wanna protect it. They also act as the insurer of a defined benefit plan and they take over defined benefit plans from insolvent plan sponsors. So the employees are not left you know, out to dry. So the bad parts, the PBGC does not guarantee 100% of workers' pensions. The amount that's guaranteed is based on the employee's age, and there's some exclusions, like if your plan offers a lump sum, the PBGC will not pay a lump sum. They don't provide any plant um, closing benefits. From an employer's perspective, like I said, if somebody wants to sell their assets or things like that during an M&A transaction, you're gonna have to negotiate with the PBGC. If your plan is really underfunded, you're gonna have to put more assets in or you're the buyer's gonna have to put more assets in, um, extensive issues and bankruptcies and a lot of negotiations. So the really ugly thing that's happening is the PBGC premiums have skyrocketed because PBGC, it's going broke. It's just, it's going broke. Um, so because the DB plans are more costly to administer, in addition because the value of the assets are going down, investments are going down, and the PBGC premiums are going up, more and more plan sponsors are terminating their plans. In order to terminate a plan, it has to have sufficient assets to pay the liabilities. And then the plan sponsor goes out and they buy an insurance contract to pay the liabilities. In 2019, 501 contracts worth $28 billion were bought in order to terminate plans, the highest since 2012. So then the, once you buy an insurance contract, you no longer get PBGC insurance, which brings in less premiums, which mean the PBGC is in a death spiral. So that's pretty ugly. If you go to the next one. So HIPAA. Um, the HIPAA is regulated by the Department of Health and Human Services and also the Office for the Civil Rights. Um, HIPAA has some privacy rules, which is great. It restricts the use and disclosure of protected health information. So it can only be used for legitimate purposes, legitimate plan purposes, um, administrative purposes, things like that, and with the consent of the individual. There's also security rules, which protect the storage and delivery of electronic PHI. Um, note that some of the HIPAA rules have been relaxed for the COVID-19 emergency. Um, I'm not gonna get into that because it's, it's just, they won't allow you to, um, you know, put something on a bulletin board, but, you know, if you know somebody is infected, they do have the right to notify other people that you've been in contact with somebody who has been infected. So the good, it protects plan participants about who can see and um, how a plan can store your PHI and how it can be disseminated. So before, you could have some, you know, blab blabbing mouth Betty who would, in your HR department, saying, oh, guess who has cancer? can't do that anymore. Um, the bad from an employer perspective is that the rules are really complicated. They have many traps for the unwary. Um, and again, same with uh, COBRA, even if you try and outsource your medical plan uh, administration, or you try and maintain only very little PHI on site, there's always going to be issues. Um, limiting your access to a small group is what most, you know, what we recommend for most people. The problem areas that I've seen are small employers where the employees wear two hats. You know, they administer your medical plan, but they're also in HR. They administer your medical plan, and they're also in accounting. Or CEOs who are just nosy and they want to say, oh, what's going on with this person? And we say, look, you're not part of the privacy workforce. We're not allowed to tell you. That doesn't go over real well, but that's the best way to insulate the company from any HIPAA liabilities. 
Um, the ugly audits are on the upswing. Um, companies often lack written procedures and other safeguards, or they're not kept up to date. And 2018 was a record year for HIPAA enforcement. So then we get to the um, ACA or Obamacare, and that was a uh, you know healthcare uh, amazing healthcare reform legislation impacting employer group health plans, individual plans, which we call the marketplace, and you where employers would have to pay penalty individuals would have to pay penalty tax if they didn't have minimum insurance, but that was later held unconstitutional, among other things. So good. It did a lot of good. It eliminated pre-existing condition limitations. Um, children can stay on their parents' insurance until age 26. I'm sure a lot of you law students probably are still on that. Um, no caps or maximums on insurance coverage. A um, million dollar caps were very, um, very popular before this. Employers are required to provide minimum benefits, preventative care at no cost to at least 95% of their full-time employees and also must offer coverage to part-time employees and part-time was defined as generally 30 hours per week. Again, the bad um, from an employer perspective, insanely complicated, insanely complicated rules. Um, the ACA complying with the ACA resulted in increased employer medical administrative and compliance costs about keeping the kids on the plans, um, about a 5% increase, uh, that in and of itself. And some employers did change their plan designs as a result, so they offered more high deductible plans, you know, so, hey, you know, we're gonna offer you a plan that's gonna comply, but you're gonna have to kick in the first $5,000 in order to participate. The ugly, depending on your perspective, the future of the ACA is in doubt. Um, the current administration has proposed many regulations to change it, gut it, um, there is a lawsuit challenging the constitu constitutionality of the remainder of the ACA due to the invalidation of the individual mandate. Supreme Court agreed to hear it. It's supposed to be heard in the new term in October. We don't know what's happening now if things are going to be changed, um, you know, because of all the delays. Uh, the, the IRS just came out before all this COVID stuff started that there's no statute of limitations on the employer's penalties um, because you only have to, well, you only, you have to file an insanely complicated um, uh, tax, tax form with the IRS showing that you comply with the 95% rule. But the IRS says that doesn't give them enough information in order to determine if you owe a penalty. So therefore there's no statute of limitations on the penalty. It makes no sense. And I'm sure that's gonna be challenged. And then finally, just a very, next one, a very broad topic, the code, Internal Revenue Code and ERISA regulate qualified defined benefit and defined contribution plans. Um, what's good is retirement plans are the third leg of financial security for employees and retirees. Um, as of 9-30-2018, there were almost 30 trillion in assets in these, in these plans. And they give employers a tool to recruit and retain employees. The regulations, insanely complex, non-discrimination testing, um, just rules that don't make any intuitive sense. Um, there's audit risks, there's litigation risks, um, and I just list on the one side uh, current ones. There's a class action risk now under defined benefit plans about using the wrong actuarial factors, stock drop cases. If you have employer securities in your plan and your stock drops, you're going to get sued. That's all there is to it. Excessive fee cases. You've got 30 different um, investment funds that you can select under your 401k plan to invest in. Um, they're saying that you don't monitor them, you pick the wrong ones, hindsight's 2020. Um, a very interesting latest legal challenge that I think is going to we're going to see a lot more about is the participant data a plan asset that needs to be protected or should the plan be compensated for it. So a lot of times you, you every retirement plan says a third party administrator that third party administrator wants to use your data mine, your plan, your plan participant data. Oh, they have how many people with college age kids? Let's try and sell them alone. Let's try and let's try and sell that data to other third parties. And I think that's a very interesting thing that's coming down the pike. So that's it for now. That's really fascinating. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mary before we move on to Judy Steiner and bank regulation? Anyone? Okay. 
So now, if I'm the host, um, which I'm not, Catherine, but you can make me the host. If you make me the host, I can access Judy's PowerPoint, I believe. You and there it is. Now. Okay. But, and there it is. Oops. It should be there because I just shared it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, I'm not going to run through, you know, this bit by bit. I, hopefully everybody's um, awake out there. I know this compliance stuff is very boring. I've been doing this for 30 years. Okay, do it however you want to, Judy Steiner. I know, yeah. The one thing I would say is, you know, when I sat in Juliet's class, Professor Kostritsky's class, I was the first first one. We were. The, she was the first year at Case Western, 8 a.m. contracts. And I would have never thought I'd be in compliance and banking. You know, that just sounds really boring. And it's where I ended up. So I would just encourage all of you to, you know, follow those open doors. And it's not all that boring. It can sound boring, but I've done a lot on the way. And um, I'm going to flip through this stuff so that you can ask questions and go on your way. But um, the, the first thing I'd like to address is just the different financial institution regulators. There's a lot of them, right? So we have the Federal Reserve Board, which Jerome Powell, you've heard him, he's the chair of that. And then there's 12, um, 12 Federal Reserve Banks, 12 regional offices that, um, and certain people are members of the Federal Reserve Board. It's a rotating thing. So We've got that, and you could be a Fed member bank, you could be a Fed non-member bank. The Fed also governs bank holding companies. You could be a national bank, which is the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is the OCC, which is larger banks for the most part. Um, the Federal um, Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is the FDIC, which is another regulatory body, and then we have the state banking regulator regulators. For example, um, Banner Bank, which is a Washington Division of Financial Institutions Bank. It's Washington, but it's, its primary federal regulator is the FDIC. And then we also have the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which we call the Fed. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau governs banks over 10 billion, which is compliance, consumer stuff. National Credit Union Administration, which is the NCUA. And then the FFIEC, which is really the conglomerate of all of them. They issue all kinds of stuff together as a group. So next slide. Um, and then we have other, other regulators, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is OFAC, which um, administers and enforces economic and trade sanctions. So we've got to follow all of those rules. And then FinCEN, which is the um, financial transactions that we they collect them and we have AML BSA a group 35 people at my bank actually that all they do is watch transactions to monitor for um, anti-money laundering bank secrecy act and anti-terrorist financing so a lot of people don't realize that but pretty much every transaction every transaction goes through that software and we have reporting requirements of course, we have the SEC, which any public company would have, and then all of the other regulators that you would have, um, OSHA, IRS, Department of Labor, et cetera. So Bureau of Workers' Comp, so heavily regulated. So a lot of that. I am not gonna go through all these laws. I, I, it's an example of everything we have to deal with. Um, it's a couple pages, so I would just scroll through those to give you an example of all of the financial institution specific laws and then the operating regulations that follow those laws that um, are uh, by the agencies. They have to, and we call them the alphabet soup for the most part. So it's reg A to Z, or you know, a lot of them have the, the letters. So that's why we call them the alphabet soup of um, regulation. And then following that is the guidance. And um, I gave some examples of guidance. There's a lot of guidance that's issued that is not regulation necessarily, but um, it's issued. And I gave a couple of examples of some current things and not so current that, that give us as banks um, guidelines to operate by. 
And while it's not regulation, we're held to that in our examinations. And then finally on the examination front, from a practical standpoint, examiners like in our bank, which were over 10 billion, they're there all the time. They have offices, we give them offices. Um, the bigger banks I'm sure have 50 to 100 at any time that are on site and they are there all the time. Each of us has an examiner in charge. We have um, examinations that or is there at least quarterly and then specific examinations that specialize in whether it's for lending or CRA or IT or what have you. So they are doing that all the time. And um, they have uh, examination manuals, so you know what they're examining, but um, a lot of it is best practices and um, you know, having that relationship with the examiners is very important and who your examiner is. So I know I flipped through that really fast, but I know people can read, so I didn't want to read that for them. And I didn't want to go over all the laws and regulations. You can look all that up, but um, I'd be glad to answer questions. So let's um, maybe stop sharing the screen um, and take people's questions. So Julie Cabela, you had a question for Judy Steiner. Um, do you remember what it was? Do you want me to read it? It was a good question. But anyone's free to ask Judy or any of the other panelists a question. Professor, probably, yeah. I don't have it in front of me, so if you could. Okay, so, so Julie Cabela asked Judy Steiner, what are the greatest risks when it comes to compliance and banking? Great question. You know, it's, we have to be nimble. So today with the pandemic going on, I mean, we're, we're just shifting our focus on how is this in terms of liquidity and interest rate risk and compliance. Um, and then with this whole small, in fact, I'm going to get on a call here on the whole small business um, package that was, was rolled out by treasury. You know, how do we comply with that and make sure that we're lending, but also complying with all the regulations, the disclosures, the AMLBSA KYC, which is the know your customers. So there's a um, there's balance there that you know you have to you have to look at. But before the pandemic, I would say the number one was cybersecurity. Absolutely, I think all banks are this cybersecurity is like crazy. But now we're shifting a little and looking at, although that's also, you know, now we're vulnerable because we've got this pandemic be, and, and the bad guys and the foreigners, which are foreign nationals, they know we're being hit with this, mm -hmm. the pandemic. So now they're going to try to get our employees and what have you. That's a good so question. Favoring. Yeah. Good question. Um, Catherine, um, Cochran, you had a question for Mary Maloney on the Department of Labor's uh, proposed fiduciary rule that was abandoned. I wasn't familiar with that, but do you want to go into that and ask your question of Mary Maloney? Yeah. Hi, Mary. Um, so I, a little bit of background, I used to work in financial services and we were watching kind of the, the proposed fiduciary rule for, for quite a few years. And then it was like, you know, just abandoned in what, 2016, 17, something like that. Um, and then I later interned with the DOL. So I kind of wanted to get your opinion on that. Do you see um, do you see the DOL picking that back up in the next couple of years? Do you see other um, like industry self-regulate regulatory agencies um, proposing their own fiduciary rule um, in like in advance of that happening? Or do you kind of see that as like a dead issue at this point? Well, it depends on the administration. You know, let's be honest, that's why it was dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. <laughs> so it, 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 that's that's just the the way it is. Um, so will it be picked up? There there are still people who think that it is the right thing to do. You know, mm -hmm. that financial industry does not have the interests of the public at heart. That they're you know commission grabbing. <laughs> you know that they're they're not taking they're not taking a fiduciary. What the rule was is that they were that the financial industry was going to be treated as fiduciaries. So. Mm -hmm you know, there were going to be strict rules on when you could take commissions and what, when you would have to put 
the, the um, I keep calling them employees, but the individual investors' interests before your own interests. Um, and so everybody went berserk and said that they were too restrictive and they probably were a little restrictive. They, you couldn't have some of the same, they were a little restrictive, but I think there could have, it could have been revised. Um, there is a regulation BI, regulation best interest, which is going into effect. It, well, who knows? It was supposed to go into effect July of this year. Now I think that might be a, a, a delayed effective date. Um, as far as retirement plan participants, that'll take care of rollovers. So if, if a financial advisor is advising on a rollover, they do have to be a fiduciary with respect to that. Um, it doesn't have hardly as much teeth as there was in, in the other ones. So that's really been the only thing that there has been. I doubt seeing self-regulation coming into play. Okay, thank you. Sure. So Noah's <clears throat> asked a question yet of Catherine Van Tassel. But I know Lauren Durham, you had a question for her. About, yes. Yes. Would you like to answer, a, ask either of your questions? Um, yeah. So it was just more about like what's going on. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, perfectly. What's going on with COVID-19 and like how to prepare companies for like a shutdown, like even if it's not like a pandemic like this, but just anything we're like everything's pretty much shut down like how do you prepare for stuff like that and like when more from a public health um standpoint that's a it's a great question and and um i think those of us in the public health community have been talking about this uh for for over a decade that you know the next pandemic um it wasn't uh it wasn't if it was when um, and so we've been we've been trying to push folks to uh, to increase uh, preparation. You know, it's just been for decades, um, in, including our laws. So, so not just uh, thinking about you know our, our um, uh, first responders uh, and the healthcare system itself, but but also um, our laws that are protecting individual liberties uh, and individual rights. Are in Ohio anyway? Our our laws here are over a hundred years old. So. Um, so, so it, it, I think right now um, it, everybody is in crisis mode, and so they're very super reactive. What will be interesting after uh, the next, I think, year or two, to two years, um, is are going to be all the changes that we're going to see in regulations uh, for all of us uh, as a result of this um, this pandemic. This has changed our reality in, in such incredibly significant ways. Uh, and we're going to have, I think that what we're going to see, and I'll, I'll be interested to hear um, uh, my co-panelists' uh, thoughts on this, is that I think we're going we're gonna to see an awful lot of uh, disaster preparedness requirements um, uh, it's, as we're thinking about environment, if we're thinking about health, we're thinking about banking, uh, that everybody's going to have to have a plan. Um, and those plans, uh, you know, we're, we're right now, we're working on it on, on the fly. Um, but we're learning. We're learning every single day of you know the things that oh I, I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> I wish I would have prepared. Um, so my co-panelists, what do you think in your arenas that the changes will be um, to the regulatory state uh, after uh, we recover from this current crisis? I would say from a financial institution, um, we we have requirements. We have backups, um, you know, backup sites, and we have to have that for the safety of the financial um, integrity of the of the um, the country. But even with this, and we actually had a tabletop. We have to have tabletops twice a year on this. But even with that, though, to your point, that it brings up stuff that we didn't think about, you know. So I think it's just going to be. It's really going to be a a game changer in terms of how those disaster preparedness um, exercises are performed. I agree. Um, On the retirement plan side, you know, same thing. We're actually worried more about, and this is with the financial, but the vanguards and the fidelities of the world. And we want to make sure that they continue, you know, to make sure that they can take the 
contributions and that our retirement plan participants are safe and that, you know, how our distribution is still going to be um, distributed and that people need their withdrawals and they need their loans and they need access to their funds and make sure that, you know, the um, safeguards from working remotely and we're transferring participant data and making sure that that is all being done safely. And, you know, like you said, the bad actors out there, you know, it, it's, there's lots of cybersecurity issues and things like that. A lot of fraud going on, which is sad, but we're yeah. seeing it a lot. They're taking advantage of people. Yep. Well, we probably have time for one more question. Anyone want to end our, our session with our panelists? Well, one student had a question about trends in the last five years for Yelena Katz in employment law? What are the trends that you've seen? Anything that you want to highlight there, or that is a highlight? I think we've seen a lot more class actions and wage and hour cases. We've seen a lot of misclassification lawsuits, uh, a lot of lawsuits from independent contractors, people mm -hmm. who claim that they should be employees, should be paid overtime but are classified as independent contractors. That's big in the news with you know, the Uber drivers and things like that. I've personally handled four or five cases of truck drivers who are usually independent contractors, but not necessarily don't own the truck, don't know, don't own what's in the truck, things like that. So they're banding together with classes. We're seeing a lot of arbitration clauses in, in agreements. So those truck drivers often will sign an arbitration agreement. So then we argue that, that this needs to go to arbitration and plaintiff's lawyers will find a hundred uh, truck drivers to bring a hundred arbitrations. And now we have to defend a hundred versus one lawsuit. And maybe it would have been better to just handle it as a class. So definitely misclassification has been a big part of it. I think we're gonna, going back to the, first, the previous question of COVID-19, I think we'll see a lot of discrimination lawsuits coming out of it. With the lawsuit, with the layoffs that we're seeing in the furloughs, there's gonna be a lot of angry employees, former employees who will bring claims uh, in the future. We don't know when this is gonna uh, happen, but my group is definitely anticipating a lot more discrimination lawsuits based on the decisions that have been made, which employees have been cut and how that's been happening. As I mentioned, I think we'll see Warren litigation, which is it's a, a law that requires 60 days notice if there's been a plant closing or a mass layoff. Obviously, people did not have 60 days in this situation that's happening right now. And although there's, uh, there's an unreasonable circumstances um, or unforeseeable circumstances exception in Warren, it still requires you to send notice if you're going to be uh, uh, laying off people or doing a mass closing. I think uh, employers are really scrambling right now, and some of them are not following those um, guidelines. Even if it's not 60 days, you still have to send the notice. And some states don't have that, that um, unforeseeable circumstances exemption. They have their own WARN Act. For example, California uh, came out a few weeks ago saying that they're going to suspend that 60-day uh, because they didn't have it. California, you, you always had to give 60-day notice. And they came out with a, um, a new rule saying that in this circumstances, they'll let you send more than six or send notice of less than 60 days. So I think we'll see that more in litigation because it's just one of those things that employers are not uh, cognizant of. They're dealing with so much right now. They're trying to make payroll. They're trying to apply for all these SBA roles. They're trying to figure out if they're a critical business. We've had um, health, health administrators coming to shut down facilities. You know, my clients think they're a critical business and then the sheriff shows up. So that's been happening in the last couple of weeks. So I think we'll, we'll definitely see a lot of litigation coming out of this situation. Well, it sounds like everyone is dealing with new challenges um, with this uh, COVID-19. I wanted to thank the panelists for sharing their expertise in the regulation of businesses. It's been very instructive and we learned a lot of things we didn't know before. Um, so anyway, just wanted to thank you and I'm probably gonna then end our formal session and um, I hope everyone has a great evening and that you stay healthy and practice social distancing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
night, everybody. Good night.